الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ادخلوا في السلم كافة سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم الله سبحانه وتعالى commands the believers ادخلوا في السلم كافة that you should enter into the submission now the submission obviously is Islam right and we know that Islam it means it, it, it it's derived from the notion of submitting and submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but not only is it a demand or a requirement that we submit to Islam but it's an actual requirement that we submit to Islam completely kafa 100% when we submit to us, one of the mistakes that we make is that we assume that if we've entered into the fold of Islam, that somehow our responsibility is over. And this is something that we should be very wary of, meaning just because we enter into the fold of Islam and we begin to practice the deen, that doesn't mean that we've attained Islam. It means we've only begun to enter Islam. And the demand is not necessarily to enter Islam, it's to enter into Islam 100%, completely so that we become absolute true Muslims. Now, the example of this, when a person wants to study physics, okay, a person says, you ask the person, what do you want to do with your life? He says, I want to study physics. I say, what do you mean you want to study physics? I want to become a physicist. Okay, you want to become a physicist. So you don't become a physicist by taking one class in physics or by listening to one online lecture in physics. If you listen to some lecture online on physics and you really like it and you say, well, you know, this is awesome, I'm going to learn, memorize everything the person says, it doesn't make you a physicist. What's required to become a physicist is that you must take years and years of study. And after you have obtained a certain level of proficiency, then and only then do you become a physicist. And this applies to everything that we, we do. I mean, if somebody wants to become a physician, it takes a decade of training to become a physician. To, be, to, earn the, to, to earn the level of, or to attain the level of proficiency necessary to be able to practice medicine, some people would argue that it takes even more than a decade because when a person finishes medical school, which is four years, first of all, they have to prepare an undergrad, which is four years. Then they go to medical school, which is another four years. Then they do residency, which is three to five years. Then they do a fellowship, which could be another three years. And even the day they finish their fellowship, when they're about to see their first patient, they're shaking. So why are you shaking? I'm really nervous. There's nobody behind me. I'm the one. I'm, there's no person backing me up. I'm, 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 the, I'm, the, I'm the main person. I'm the main physician now. And people say, well, you know, you don't need to be nervous because you have people with experience sitting around. This person has 10 more experience, years of experience. This person has 20 more years of experience. So a person who wants to attain, who wants to attain a degree of uh, proficiency in anything, they require years and years and years of, uh, uh, of training. Okay, so anyway, what I was trying to remind us, remind us of is that when we desire to attain proficiency, it takes a tremendous amount of effort to actually, uh, to actually reach that degree of proficiency. And we shouldn't make the assumption that just by one single talk or by simply performing a certain degree of acts, that that's going to then somehow make us proficient in that field. So this is the demand that's placed on us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't necessarily ask us to enter into the deen. He asks us to enter into the deen kafa, 100% completely. Now, there are many pitfalls that arise in this notion of understanding that we have to enter into the deen completely. First and foremost, people make the mistake of thinking that the day they step into the fold of Islam, that's the day that they've attained their proficiency. And you see this, the moment somebody becomes a little bit righteous, you know, the whole, their whole life they've been sort of astray, and all of a sudden they wake up, and the next thing they want to do, they want to lecture everybody else. They want to blame the whole world around them. 
You know, I'm, I'm now doing this, so how come my brother's not doing this? How come my wife's not doing this? How come my sister's not doing this? How come my friend's not doing this? It's the first step. The first thing that happens, they begin to blame everybody around them. They, meaning what? They've d assumed that they have reached some degree of proficiency, and now the whole world is at fault except them. Right? And that is a major mistake that occurs in the very, very initial phases of Islam. I'll give you a simple example. My son is sitting here. He'll probably get upset with me. <laughs> My son signed up for a, uh, what is it, karate, kung fu, one of these things. One of these, judo, judo. He signed up for a judo class. Okay? And, uh, and it's not a judo class. It's like a judo club where they teach you, where they teach you judo. So he goes there, right? The very first day he, 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 this is a 45 minute class. And the very first day he comes back from the class and he wants to drop everybody in the house. Okay, he's coming to me, he's going to drop me, he grabs me, he does some moves on me. He wants to take his sister, he wants to drop her, he wants to take his mom, he wants to drop his mom, subhanAllah. So this is what, and he's walking around thinking that he is, you know, Bruce Lee or whatever the major person in that, in that area is. Now, you know, that's the mistake that a person makes very initially and it looks, sounds so funny, right? Because... To me, I'm looking, and this is just a child, and this is the way the child responds to being in that particular stimulus. But the reality is we all do the same thing. We're almost children in the deen. We get just a little bit of proficiency in the deen. You know, we take this first step into the deen, and then we see a huge difference between ourselves and everybody else. And very quickly we begin to judge. Very quickly we begin to blame. Very quickly we begin to say, I don't know what to do. These people are not practicing, and I'm practicing, and I don't know how I can make them more like me. But the reality is we're nowhere. We're nowhere. You know, we haven't entered into the deen completely. We've barely taken a step. So this is the first mistake that occurs. That we assume that just because we've taken one step into the deen, that we've attained some degree of proficiency. Now, so what's the important, another important point from that, or another important thing that we should recognize from that, is that we then have to, rec we then have to protect ourselves against that. Right? Because we don't want that mistake to occur. We don't want to run around thinking we can drop people because somebody will really drop us one day. Right? That's the first thing. You ought to be careful about how you attack shaitan. And, and the second thing is that you want to really be able to attain a true degree of proficiency. Now, so, the, so from that, we then realize that, number one, we have to, it, that it, we should realize that it takes years and years and years to attain this proficiency. I'll tell you a very interesting statement that Sheikh Zulfikar made to me once. He said that, you know, suluk is a very, very long path. And the deception of suluk, the deception of suluk, is that it appears that the final step is, that the final stage is one step away. But the reality is that the path turns and brings you all around before you actually come to the end point. So, this would be the example. Look, this is the, this is the point you're standing at. This is the end point. So, when you're standing at the first step, you see the end point. Because immediately you begin to be introduced to the Sahaba, to Rasulullah, so you're seeing the end point right away. Now what happens, what we don't realize is that to reach this end point, you can't just go here. The path goes this way, goes all the way like this, and then eventually brings you back here. So that what you thought was one step, actually is thousands. But you don't appreciate it. And I, I remember vividly one time I went to New York, and somebody picked me up from the airport. And... You know, the way New York is, is that it's almost like an island. So you have to cross over only on certain bridges. So we're driving, and he says, we're going there. And I can see from my eyes that we're going to be there. It looks like you're five minutes away. And we get there an hour and a half later. Because we had to go all the way through all these different blocks and go across this bridge and go all the way around and come back to that same point. And then I started thinking, subhanAllah, this is exactly what Sheikh Zofar used to say to us. That when you enter into the deen, immediately you begin to see your goal. Just in front of you, you see that, well, this is the goal. But the reality is the path is thousands of steps long. So this is the very first thing that happens. And Sheikh Zulfikar used to say that one of the very early training of a salik is to, for them to quickly recognize that they actually are nothing. Because they immediately think that they've attained something. And so the very first step is to make them realize that they haven't attained anything. Now, how can you protect yourself against the misconception that you've attained something? Well, number one, time, right? The longer you begin to do this, the more you begin to realize that, well, there's a lot of pitfalls on the way and there are a lot of traps. But another way is to continuously train in the field. You have to continuously develop yourself. The person who makes the first step in development and then stops and then takes all of their energy to judge someone else, they're in a very dangerous situation. But if they're fortunate enough to have a teacher 
who actually says, wait a minute, let me show you that you're nothing. Let me grab you and just take you a little further. The moment you get a little further, you immediately begin to recognize you know, you know nothing. Now, like I say that my son, the first day he goes to judo, he comes back, he thinks he can drop everybody, right? Once he's in there for a year, then he's going to realize that, oh, I need 20 more years. It takes that first year. And then you start realizing that I need 20 more years. And in fact, the further you get, the more you recognize that this is going to take me forever. You look at the physicians when they're training, you know, a physician who's finished four years of undergrad, four years of med school, three years of residency, three years of fellowship. The day they get out, they say, I'm so scared. If you really speak to them one-on-one, -on -one, you know them. You know, they're talking at their, at their level. They say, I'm so scared. I'm so worried. So what are you worried about? You've been training for 15 years for this day. No, no, I'm very scared because I barely know anything. You know, I don't know this. I don't know that. Look at this person knew this and this person knew that. You feel like you know nothing. And you talk about, you talk to people who've been studying, for example, karate or kung fu or something for 20 years. They say that my teacher studied for 40. I'm nothing like my teacher. You say, what are you talking about? You won the Olympic gold medal. No, 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 that's just a medal. They just gave me that. I'm nothing like my teacher. And that's the secret of the deen. When a person gets beyond that first step, right, that's when they begin to recognize that subhanAllah, whoa, there's a lot more to do here. This is just a little, I just took the very first initial step and there's so many more to go. Sheikh Zulfikar told me another thing one time. He said that his training, he said, my training took me 20 years. Now, I mean, it's, you're constantly training, but he was just sort of putting it, wrapping it around in a, in a mechanism of understanding. He says that my training took me 20 years. He said 90% of my training occurred in 10 years. The first 90% of my, my training occurred in the first 10 years. And the last 10% took 10 more years. The first 90% of my training took 10 years. And the last 10% took 10 more years just to show you how how much there's how much remains when a person attains a certain degree of proficiency so one way to avoid this pitfall is to be in the company of people who understand the training right because they will wake you up now you see that when we're in college just as an example when we're in college everybody awake you know you see this awakening of the dean that occurs in the MSA you can go back to your college years. Either you're in college or you've passed college or you might be there eventually. But I can go back to my college years and I can say, you know, I knew 40 people that, that, were, that realized and uh, came back to Islam in my particular class, for example. And then I look back and I say that, you know, most of them sort of took that first step and didn't go really beyond that because they didn't have anybody to tell them that there was the next step. So they kind of took one step, they, got, they were awoken to this deen, they got a little bit of information about the deen, and then they sort of fell back into this pattern of just dealing with daily life. But there were a few people who came in the company of scholars, in the company of mashayikh, and those mashayikh dragged them a couple steps further, and then they began to realize, subhanAllah, there's way more to do here. This is not some superficial sideshow. There is much, much more to do here. This is a day and night dedication if a person really wants to be able to attain the pinnacle and the deen. And it's those people. You can go, I, can, I mean, I've done so much traveling and, and meeting with people. I can tell you that the common theme is that he who came in the company of one who knows how to train, whether it be a scholar or a hafid or whether it be a sheikh, those people then recognize that they actually had a long way to go. And it's funny, I mean, I look back and laugh at college. You know, we used to recite the Quran and we used to, close our, squeeze our ears and try to make it as melodious and beautiful as possible and no, had no ideas about the rules of Tajweed. No ideas about the rules of Tajweed. And we would think that we were, you know, like copying the Qurra and we thought that we could recite beautifully. We used to fight who's going to give the Adhan, who can give the more beautiful Adhan. We all knew nothing. We were just a bunch of kids. And now, you know, when you listen, if you, if now once the idea, the notion of Tajweed arises, you can't even, you wouldn't even be able to swallow listening to a person recite, no matter how beautiful they recite. Because you say, this person's breaking every rule of Tajweed. It's interesting. Um, uh, Ali Taft, Ali Taft, uh, you know, he's one of the members of our community. He memorized the Quran and he began to teach the Quran. And after he was teaching the Quran, then he, uh, he you know, he was, he'd reached such a degree of proficiency. And he was teaching people Tajweed, and we would listen to this, and I would say, wow, this Tajweed is perfect. And he told me, I, and then, he, then he happened to go away and spend some time in the company of scholars. I said, what did you do with the last two years? He said, I learned Tajweed. I'm looking at him, subhanAllah, you learned Tajweed? You're the Tajweed teacher, we all respect you. When you recite, we're all listening to how perfect you recite. He said, no, 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 you, that was nothing. I was making so many mistakes. I learned Tajweed. I'm still learning Tajweed. 
Because why? Because they attain a certain degree of proficiency. Now, you look at people who don't have any proficiency. Ten years ago, people used to stand up on the musalla in Chicago, and they would recite, they would break every rule of tajweed, and we would say, mashallah, this person's reciting, subhanAllah, incredible, it sounds beautiful. And now, once a little bit of tajweed comes into the picture, then we begin to recognize, no, 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 wait a minute, there's a new level. That the Qur'an was not only revealed, it was revealed with tajweed. And we know that when the, when Angel Jibreel salam, brought the Qur'an to Rasulullah SAW, it was given with tajweed. Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recited it with tajweed or, or in, revealed it with tajweed, we can say. So, I mean, this is just a simple example. But within the deen, there are levels of proficiency, but you need to be in the company of those people that awaken you to that. And otherwise, you, decept, you, you begin to foolishly think that you've attained something. So we have to, we have to. One of the key things to avoid this pitfall, we have to put ourselves in the company of people who are, who are striving. No, who are, who are training in this way. That's the first point. That you have to find people who train and, and constantly bounce your ideas off of them to make sure that are you, are you right or are you wrong? It, you know, when we, this is a, I'm a, my, my profession, surgical pathology. Surgical pathology is an art. It's, a, it's an art. There's, you can't compute a, a result and come up with an answer. You have to look at something. I look at something, and based on color patterns and recognition, you have to say this is cancer or this is not cancer. Now what happens? I'm looking at these slides, and I've been trained to do that. So I know this is cancer and this is not cancer. The residents, they spend four years sitting across from me, and they keep saying, they look at the same slides constantly, and they say, you know, not cancer. And I say, no, 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 that's cancer. Then they say, not cancer. I say, no, 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 that's cancer. Not cancer. No, 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 that's cancer. Until four years down the line when they actually finally figure it out. That, okay, no, that's cancer. And I'm still taking cases, and I'm showing people who are 30, 40 years experience beyond me. Right? Now, there are some people that have no training like that. You know, they just go into a program, and they just start, you know, learning to make simple diagnoses, and they think they know it, and they make mistakes when they go out. But because of the level of proficiency, the degree of training that's occurring, and because we have teachers around us, that's what awakens us to the reality that, no, 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 it requires a lot more. This isn't just so straightforward. So that's the first point, that we, as people who are striving, should always put ourselves in the company of those people who are training others. Because it's only, it's only they that will be able to guide us, to awaken us to every aspect of our life, for us to recognize that our tajweed is lacking, that maybe we're lacking in some aspect of our iman, maybe we're lacking in some aspect of our practice of fiqh, maybe we're lacking in some aspect, etc., of the deen. So that's point one. Point two is that we have to keep ourselves in the company of those people that are striving. Not only training, but that are striving. When you put yourself in the company of those people that are striving, then and only then do you begin to realize that there's a next level to strive towards. You know, if you go and you take five karate classes, and then you go to the fifth grade, to some fifth grade, you go, you become a fifth grade gym teacher. You can do this, this, and this, and all of them will be praising you, right? You can just move your hand in funny ways and say, ah, like this, and people will say, whoa. The, all the kids will say, ah, oh, this is a kung fu master, this and that. He knows karate. He knows everything. But that's because you're impressing fifth, five, fifth graders or, towards, you know, seven-year-olds or eight-year-olds. They don't know. So, yes, if you t attain a small degree of proficiency in the dean, and you hang around a bunch of people that don't have that degree of proficiency, then you become the big sheikh. You become the one who's trained, and you, uh, the, your whole family will call you Molana and Alim and sheikh, and etc. But if you hang around people that are five, ten years advanced from you, then you know you do this, and you'll look like a fool, because you know that the people of rea the, the people of reality are sitting in front of you. So it's very important to surround yourself with people that are striving as well. It's only in that, in that environment of striving that a person then awakens to the fact that they actually haven't achieved what they need to achieve. And all of this boils down to what? It boils down to, it, it, all of this is a summary of the solution of what problem? The solution of pride. One of the most common emails that I receive from people who just have taken the first few steps in the deen, they say that I feel within myself pride. When I speak, I want people to listen to me. And when I speak, I like it when people tell me, I'm, I, oh, I know so much. And, oh, can, can you give me more advice on this and more advice on that? The solution is twofold. Number one, stay in the company of the mashayikh. The more you stay in the company of the mashayikh, the more they take you and they slap you once in a while. They wake you up. You know, we get, when we get scolded by our teacher, it hits for one year. You know, it doesn't, it bothers you for one year. And many times that's occurred where we get scolded. And it, awaken, it awakens us to, to our own reality. 
And then number two, sit in the company of those who are striving. Because then you don't, you don't sit, you don't sit in the company of those that are saying, oh, you're great. You've achieved so much. Wow, mashallah, you're such a righteous, pious person, et cetera, et cetera. They begin to fill you and pump you up. Instead, you sit with people who are crying because they realize that they haven't achieved anything. And the final sign of having achieved something is what? The final sign of having achieved something is, is that you then think that you achieved nothing. That's the end point. The person who's, who, you know, the, the, you, you look at, uh, you look at people who've attained maximum proficiency in a field and they'll tell you they know nothing. Because they know the field and they know how vast that field is and they know the depth of the field and they know the limitations of a human being. You ask somebody, you ask a physician who's trained in nephrology, you know, and he's completely certified in nephrology, what do you know? He says, I know this much. I, I know nothing. I just know the superficial, superficial aspects of this science. Why? Because he's now become completely clear. It's, all, it's become completely clear to him that this knowledge is so vast and so broad, and he's attained just a drop from that tiny, tiny, vast ocean of knowledge. Now, if that nephrologist, who has a, lim- a finite amount of knowledge, it all can be contained in a book, is telling you that they know nothing, then what about the Muslim, who recognizes that Allah is infinite, and whatever they attain is just a drop from an ocean? And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far, you know, limitless in every single way. Then that person begins to realize that subhanAllah, I have attained nothing and there's no way I can ever attain anything. That's the sign that the person has attained Islam. That's the sign. And you listen to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and his complaints, and he's complaining to Allah that I have yet to worship you the way you deserve to be worshipped. I have yet to, to praise you the way that you deserve to be praised. This is the sign of proficiency. This is the sign that a person has actually achieved something in the deen. That they begin to realize that they've achieved nothing. And that's the end point. Sheikh Zulfiqar, by one of the things that he told them, the way you know that a person's attained fana is that they then will appreciate that they are they know nothing. And that's how you know that a person's reached the end point. Not 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 this kind of oh no no brother, I know nothing, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. Not that. They really deeply inside they realize that they are nothing. That there is nothing they have to say. They have nothing to add. That this, you know, that they, that, that this is too deep and too vast and their teachers were far advanced and that they just are a minor, a tiny reflection of that which their teachers have, have, have maintained. And, and a person who becomes proficient in knowledge, that's, that's what they begin to realize. People would come to Imam Abu Hanifa and ask him questions, and most of the time he would say, I don't know. So many, so many times they would ask him a question, and he would say, I don't know. Imam Malik constantly, rahmatullah he would constantly be saying, I don't know, I don't know. If he doesn't know, then who knows? If he doesn't know, then who knows? Yet constantly it would be, I don't know. And nowadays we sit in our dinners, and any topic that comes up, everybody knows. Everybody knows. Some complicated fit question comes up at a dinner, you know, we're all just Muslims sitting together and having dinner. And everybody has an opinion. No, no, brother, this is the answer. That's the answer. This is the answer. It's a sign that we have, we're have. we immature in our deen. We have a long way to go before we attain maturity. So we, we need to, number one, put ourselves in the company of those who train. And number two, put ourselves in the company of those who are training. These two aspects will protect us from the deception of assuming that we've attained anything. Because this is a very long path. And its end, it comes at the very end. It's a very long path, and its end comes at the very end. You attain, you'll attain that end at the very, very end. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to be among those who appreciate the reality of what we have enter, entered into. And may He make us among those who enter into the deen kafa. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al-azim.